Well, in my secular job, I deal with a lot of people who are not Christians. Uh, and I see many of the things that they go through, and I, I recognize within myself that um, oftentimes their lives are, are, would probably be best described as those who really do not have peace. Now, with that being said, let me say this, there, there are a lot of things I struggle with in life. Um, I have trials and temptations just as, as anyone else, and I think oftentimes people maybe even look at the, the preacher and think, well, you know, he's, he's got it so good. Well, all Christians struggle with trials and temptations throughout life. Uh, there's no Christian that is, is so inept that they are, is, you know, is so distanced from the world that they don't have to deal with those types of issues. We oftentimes do. And so I was thinking about that a little bit throughout the last day. And uh, when I picked a lesson, really, I, I'm just going to look at uh, Romans chapter 5. If you will go to Romans chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. Uh, and if you want to know the title for the lesson, it would be Romans 5, 1 through 11. I don't have a title for it. But I did, cho I, I did choose this because we as Christians, we do deal with, trials. We deal with struggles in this life. We deal with temptations. Uh, and, and the Christian oftentimes, the faithful Christian, they fare much better than those who are non-Christians. And if you're watching this and you're not a Christian, you may wonder why. And, and if you are a Christian and you're struggling uh, and you're looking for peace, really Romans chapter 5 could help out quite a bit. And so what we're going to do is look at the uh, individual verses and I'll make some notes on them. Uh, and I don't have a time set, so we're just going to let it go until, uh, until I come to the last verse here that I chose. Let's begin to talk a little bit about this troubled world that we live in. And let's notice what Paul says over in Romans 5. We're going to start in verse 1. He says, Therefore, being justified by faith, <clears throat> we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul here is continuing with the theme that he's already been dealing with, and that is justification, or being just in God's sight. It's the idea of being righteous. And here in Romans 5.1, he begins to talk about having peace, but he ties it back to the idea of justification. Before I begin to look at the passage, ask yourself, how many of you guys know unfaithful Christians who do not have peace in this world? They, they're, they're not faithful uh, regarding the faith. Maybe they're not, re they're not faithful regarding their attendance or whatever the issue may be. And, and they certainly don't have, they don't have peace. Now, I do have to make uh, another statement. There are those who are faithful Christians who struggle with many of the same trials, and yet they find a way to have peace. What is Paul trying to get to? Well, let's start off by looking at some key phrases here in Romans 5.1. He begins to talk about being justified by faith. I'm going to quote uh, a very well-known preacher. I guess his name doesn't matter other than to attribute the quote to him. Uh, and that would be Brother David Lipscomb. And he made this quote. He said, To be justified by faith is to be purified by doing the things contained in the law of which faith is the leading principle. Well, Brother Lipscomb has it right here because when he begins to talk about being justified by faith, he's not assuming one means or thinks the idea of faith only. Uh, Brother Lipscomb ties this back directly to the faith, which is really what Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about being justified or being righteous through the law of faith. Okay, He's talking about the system of faith. <clears throat> the system of faith is our New Testament. Uh, that is our inspired word, which is, if you're not a Christian, this, the inspired word is what logically tells us how we are to behave, how we are to worship. Uh, it, it, it is, it's our guide uh, to allow us, in essence, to find peace in this life. And that's really where Paul goes. He says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace. Well, there is a peace which is associated with the justification, which is from an obedient faith. Now, there are those who maybe are not Christians. They live in this life, and they, they're doing very well. They have lots of money. They, uh, they're not dealing with trials and temptations and struggles, and they think they have peace. 
I guess the ultimate question would be is do they have peace with God? Now, if they're not being faithful Christians, certainly they do not. And I know that because here in Romans 5.1, he, he associates justification or being righteous with having peace. And certainly this is a peace with God. So as Christians, yes, we are justified by the faith or the system of faith. And we could look at a number of passages that would, that would support that. You could go over and look at the book of James. Uh, James very clearly describes that also. But here he associates justification through faith with those who have peace. Now, you begin to think about why it is that Jesus even came and, and had his ministry here on earth. One was to bring mental peace for the follower of God through salvation. One was to actually uh, allow reconciliation, and we're talking about peace between man and between God, and also to bring peace between Jew and Gentile in one church. Now, we could look at all of those things, and we could look at them in detail. I didn't write down any notes on them. But if you think about it this way, all of those points that I just mentioned are summed up by what Paul says. He talks about being justified by the faith. The one faith only leads to one group of Christians, and that is those that are, uh, those are faithful and have been added to the church. Uh, and they have this peace with God. They're faithful. They have peace with God. It helps to bring peace in this life. It can't bring total peace because we're going to deal with, with a number of problems. <clears throat> But in essence, it's the God-to-man reconciliation, which is really the basis of, of our source of peace and even our reconciliation with other men. <clears throat> There's a certain way that we are to interact with other people. Uh, and it varies a little bit between the non-Christian and the Christian. And as I, as I spoke on last week, all of that certainly includes love. But... Paul here in Romans 5.1 is talking about, he says that we have this peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, again, the justification is through the faith that we received by inspiration. This justification through the faith allows us to have peace, and this peace is only accessible through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, when you break it down into a nutshell, I mean, it's only because of Jesus that anyone has access to this peace and salvation. Listen to Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, there's a lot of people maybe that are not really worried about salvation in and of itself. Many people maybe are really just worried about their wants and their focuses in this life. They're worried about being happy in this life, and that may have nothing to do with being at peace with God. They have peace in the things that they do in the world. They're not worried about the peace with God. But if they truly want peace, that peace is only accessible through Jesus Christ and through the one faith. Romans 5, 2, let's keep going on. He says, "...by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand." and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Grace is how we are offered not only salvation, but also peace, which is found in Christ. Uh, the very fact that Christ came and was willing to die on the cross on man's behalf, that was simply the grace of God. Uh, and there are a lot of people who think they simply become a Christian simply by grace only. Well, as we've looked at the previous verse, that's not true. It's, it's through justification of the faith or the system of faith. None of us deserve salvation. But Christ was willing to come and to li live a sinless life so that each of us would have the opportunity to be justified through the faith. And in being justified through the faith and being part of the church, we have access to this peace. Now, it's not something that we can do once and then walk away from. That's taught by a lot of groups, right? Uh, well, you simply have to have had faith in Christ at one point, and then anything after that doesn't really matter. Well, that's not what Paul says here. Paul talks about having access by faith into this grace, but then he says, wherein we stand. The idea here is, is that we are standing in this grace. The same way we access the grace is the same way that we stand, continue standing in the grace, and that is by being justified through the faith. And so we stand 
confident in the fact that God has bestowed upon us His grace. We stand confident in the Word, which tells us to, to how we can remain in access to that grace. And a lot of people really have, I don't know what else to call it, they have this cheap substitute of salvation where they can think whatever they want and do whatever they want and think that God's going to continue to grant them grace or to give them grace even in the first place. <clears throat> and if you think about it, virtually everyone you talk to thinks they're going to heaven. Right? Hell sounds like a horrible place. It's described as a horrible place. I had that discussion yesterday with somebody uh, in my secular workplace. Hell is described as a horrible place. Nobody wants to go there, and so it seems like everybody today seems to think that they're going to receive God's grace and they're going to have peace. Well, so far, Paul's beginning to get us to understand that this is only accessible for Christians. This is a peace between man and God. It does help bring peace through the worldly struggles and trials that we have. And, and listen to... Listen to 2 Thessalonians 1.8. It's no wonder that everyone wants to think they're going to heaven. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, notice this, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That goes right back to Romans 5.1 as we begin to talk about being justified through faith, through the system of faith. Now, <clears throat> notice in Romans 5.2, he gives us a little more information. He says, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So we, we have access by faith into this grace. We continually are standing in it, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Well, there's many blessings that we have in Christ. Uh, one of those certainly is when we begin to talk about the, the judgment which is coming, which I just mentioned most people, they don't want to think about the judgment. Christians should be looking towards the judgment, especially I mean, when we're faithful. But it's not just that. We also have in this life many of the blessings because of the glory of God. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Many of the things that I have been blessed with um, because I'm a Christian are in this physical world. Let me just, I'll, I'll mention a few. I have been blessed by... Um, a multitude of brothers and sisters in Christ. I have been blessed by uh, their friendship and the interaction and the love that we have with one another. I've been blessed in this life by being able to gather on the Lord's Day with fellow Christians and, and partake in worship with them. But as you begin to talk about those, and, and those are in this physical world, what Christians really get from um, from rejoicing in this hope of the glory of God is really the spiritual blessings. I know that it's going to be a tough life. I know I'm going to deal with some hard things, and I do get many physical blessings from, from being a Christian, but we're talking about spiritual blessings. That's my ultimate concern, really. That's my ultimate concern for my family. Where are they going to spend their eternity? Where will my wife spend her eternity? Where, my, where will my children spend their eternity? I'm worried about the spiritual blessings because, I, as I already mentioned, there is a place called hell, and there's going to be vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel, and so I want them to have spiritual blessings. I think the hope that I have as a Christian is much different than many people today have as far as hope. There's a lot of people today who, I mean, they hope they go to heaven, they hope that they're pleasing God, even though they really have never studied the Bible and even though they, they don't worship. I, I would say the majority of people I talk to who, who describe themselves as spiritual, they don't, they don't even worship anywhere. And yet the majority of them will describe themselves as Christians. That's not the kind of hope that a Christian has. A Christian has confidence. And we even looked at that this last weekend. We talked about how we have confidence and we have courage. That's not like the majority of people around us. We have confidence and courage because we know the promises of God, because we have these spiritual blessings, and because we, we know that we have been faithful to the faith, uh, we can have this peace. Well, he goes on. We're going to look at verse 3 here. He begins to talk about trials. Nobody likes trials. Trials do have a purpose, but nobody likes them. I mean, I, I'm going to be the first to admit I don't like trials, and 
And if you think my life is so perfect and so easy, I have trials just like everybody else. Romans 5.3, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. He says, and not only so. Paul says that many Christians, we have these blessings in Christ, but he then begins to expand on that list. He says, we glory in tribulations. Now, most people, when they read that, would say, I don't think I glory in tribulations. I don't really glory in, in these trials and these uh, persecutions or afflictions that I'm going through. But Paul is talking about, and he's making it clear, that the Christian will deal with struggles, with trials, with persecution, with sin, with temptation. And, and let me just say, I've dealt with all of those and still deal with all of those. The same as all of you. And all of our, our trials and temptations and struggles are different for each of us. But we all deal with that. And it, as I already mentioned, most people don't glory through those things. For many, it causes anxiety and st- distress and it causes hardships, but Paul says we should glory through it. Now, that's a key characteristic that really lets the world see that we're different. You may say, how? I don't necessarily hide uh, the fact that maybe I'm struggling with trials or temptations, but I do want those around me, the non-Christian, to see that I can go through those trials and those temptations faithfully. I do want them to see that I have confidence in my Christian faith. I do want them to see that I I have courage to endure. Uh, And so that makes us a little bit different than the non-Christian. We ought to be able to, as Paul says, rejoice through whatever these afflictions are. And again, I know that's hard, whether it's suffering or persecution or or, or dealing with struggles with loved ones. Uh, And it's through that self-denial that we give the glory to our our Heavenly Father. We have a number of examples we could go back and look at. The apostles have given us a number of examples. You remember when Paul and Silas were in prison and they were beat? And I would say the majority of us, if we had something like that happen to us, we, we wouldn't be glorying. Most of us would not be. And yet we have the example in Acts 16, 25, where they're singing songs uh, and they're, they're praising God. And I have to be honest with you, I have, I have fallen short of that kind of peace through a number of trials in my life. I find that as I mature in my faith, I get better. But I'm not to that point yet. But that is, that's where I strive to be, and that is, that's the type of peace that we should, we should have during these trials. He says, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. When we begin to look at trials in our lives, really from a biblical aspect, uh, what we realize is is that they do form patience. They cause us to understand that even though we're struggling, we can make it through it. Even though we are, are dealing with hardships, they won't last forever. We know that when we wake up, there's going to be another sunrise. And for the Christian, the very fact that Again, we've been justified through the faith. Uh, We have this peace with God. It helps us to be able to get through these tribulations and and to be able to rejoice. Not because of the tribulation in and of itself, but because we've been faithful through the tribulation. Now, that's that's the opposite way of, of how the majority of people in the world think. Right? The car breaks down. We don't rejoice. Uh, and the world, when they deal with financial problems, family problems, marital and relationship problems, whatever it might be, their goal is not usually, how can I make it through whatever this is faithful according to God's standard. They're, they're, they're not looking at it like that. But the Christian is. The Christian is supposed to realize that these tribulations, they do work patience. And really the ultimate goal is that we can make it through whatever it is we're dealing with faithfully. He goes on, verse 4, and patience, experience, and experience hope. I think I fully agree with that. As I deal with tribulations and struggles and trials in my life, one of the things that I get is, one, you, you begin to learn patience. I find that much easier the older I get, but 
that's tied in with the next thing he says, which is experience. The older I get, uh, the more experience I get, and that causes me to have patience. I don't, th I don't think you find a lot of older people usually who are faithful Christians getting involved in bickering and fighting and, and all of the stuff that oftentimes you'll see the younger, immature Christians or people in the world getting involved in. And that's because they've, they've learned patience, they've learned experience, that experience even increases in the hope. And guys, this is being able to make it through tribulations. That's been a very common theme for Christians. Listen to Hebrews 12:1. Wherefore, seeing we are, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, I think we understand that patience, as we've already mentioned, is not the end of the list. He begins to talk about experience working hope. Well, once we've become righteous through obedience to the gospel, and we begin to persevere and to make it through all of these trials and temptations and things that we're struggling with, we begin to gain experience in how to overcome the next trial. And that increases my hope. The very fact that I've made it through other trials previously in my life allows me to have hope that I can make it through additional ones. And the very fact that maybe it's not something I have dealt with, but it, it is a trial I've seen another Christian deal with, and they've gotten through that successfully, again, gives me hope that I, as a Christian who's striving to be faithful, can make it through the same type of temptation, the same type of struggle. Romans 5.5, 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. Now, I'm going to touch on this here a little bit. Really, it, des it deserves a whole other sermon, and I'll mention where to go, I guess, when I get to that, because I don't have any notes here for that. But let's focus in on, and hope maketh not ashamed. Hope, being brought about by all these different trials and struggles and things that I deal with, now, that doesn't make a Christian ashamed or disgraced or dishonored. I don't have a problem describing to someone why I have a hope that I have, even though I'm undergoing all of these different tribulations and trials. And if you begin to think about all the things associated with the trials that people around us deal with, uh, we would think that they would make us ashamed, but trials don't necessarily mean that you're, you're not faithful. I know faithful Christians that, that deal with trials. And I know unfaithful Christians that deal with trials. And I know people out in the world who are not Christians who deal with trials. And so, Paul says trials handled correctly, they make us as Christians even more faithful. And again, I know the world today really, as of late, they've tried to make it, uh, they've tried to make it embarrassing or shameful to be a Christian. Matter of fact, many people are they're dealing with persecution and trials because they claim to be Christians. And Paul says the hope that we have, tied in with what he's mentioned earlier, the peace that we have, it, it makes us not ashamed. There's no reason for us to be ashamed. Even if the world were to come down on us and we're dealing with struggles and trials and whatever, we have no reason to be ashamed, especially when those trials are because we are Christians. He goes on and he says, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Well, why does the love of, why does the love of God um, in our hearts cause one to not feel ashamed? That's a logical question. When the answer is because the Christian can clearly see that God made grace possible through Christ. And if I'm dealing with struggles and trials and temptations, especially because of my faith, uh, there's no reason for me to be ashamed. Not when I'm making it through those trials and, and tribulations faithfully. Now, without His grace, I guess you could say I could be ashamed through these trials. I mean, uh, but because of Jesus and what He's done and because of His grace, I can remain faithful through these trials. And, and even if I were to fall short, I still have a way to be reconciled back. I have a way to repent of those sins uh, and to continue to live faithfully. And let me say that for those that maybe are watching this, if you're a Christian and, and you're willing to be able to admit that you're not faithful, whether you're, 
whether you're forsaking the assembling, Hebrews 10, 25, whether you're involved in, um, I'll just throw stuff out there, stealing, fornication, adultery, uh, homosexuality, uh, drunk, drunkenness, whatever it may be, if you're a Christian and you're struggling and dealing with a number of these trials and temptations, you need to understand that al although because you're not being justified through the faith, you're not being faithful to the Word of God, that grace has been removed from you. And we could go back and talk about falling from grace. And there's passages that talk about uh, you've fallen from your own steadfastness. There's no doubt that grace of God can be removed from one who is a, a Christian when they've been unfaithful. At any point when you fall, you can repent. You can continue to walk in the light and be cleansed by the blood of Christ, 1 John 1, 7 through 9. And I have to say that because I, I don't want people to lose hope. As Christians, we don't lose hope. Now, if you're a faithful unchristian, you ought not to have hope. But don't lose hope. You can be faithful once again. He goes on and says, By the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. Now, I'm going to approach this a little bit, but I am going to... I'm going to have to probably point you somewhere else because for those, who've, for those who've been taught incorrectly on this, probably much of what I say to you right now is going to come across as very unusual. Maybe you've never heard it. Maybe you disagree with it. The love of God is given to us in an abundant amount through the Holy Spirit. Now, again, the way that this is done is really misunderstood by the world around us. Here's something we need to ask as we begin to attack this phrase, by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. Is Paul speaking of personal revelation by the Spirit to each of us individually? Well, the answer is no. Is Paul suggesting that the very minute you become baptized, you receive the Holy Spirit? Again, the answer is no. I would uh, point you to go, to go over and look at uh, Acts chapter 8. Um, I don't have it written down in my Bible. Uh, but if you skip down there, you'll see that the Samaritans, uh, they were immersed, but they had not received the Holy Spirit. You then have the apostles that come down, and they bestow to them the gifts of the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit, through the laying on of hands. I believe it's Acts 8, verse 16 and 17 by memory. Okay? So is Paul talking about personal revelation? Well, no, he's not. And a number of passages we could deal with would, would talk about that. The Holy Spirit wasn't given unto me, and I am not... I, I do not have the ability to speak by inspiration. I don't receive revelation. Uh, was he trying to get us to understand that there was something else involved? Is he intending to tell us that the abundant love of God is made to us known through the Holy Scriptures? Well, the answer is yes. It's not individually. I don't receive direct revelation from God, and whether you may not believe this or not, neither do you, neither does anyone else. Logically, if that were true, if I've, I've mentioned before, then we would continuously be adding new material to our Bibles. But we don't do that. Uh, all, of, all of the inspired revelation given to men, that's included in our Bible. Uh, write down Jude 1.3, the faith was once delivered. It was delivered by inspiration. It's all been recorded. If men are still receiving divine revelation today, it should be being added to our Scriptures. But it's already been delivered so it's not continuing to be delivered. Now you may be saying, so you're saying the Holy Spirit doesn't work today? Well, we've addressed this in class here, but uh, the Holy Spirit does work. He strengthens, Ephesians 3.16. He sanctifies, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. He saves, Titus 3.5. He justifies, 1 Timothy 3.16. Uh, he prompts us to love God, Romans 5.5. He leads us as God's children, Romans 8, 16. And He will eventually take part in even raising us up from the dead, Romans 8, 11. However, with all of that being said, I do not want you to misunderstand that the Holy Spirit is doing anything directly to you because He does not interfere with man's free will. Now, some teach that. Some teach that the very second the Holy Spirit wants you to become saved, He comes inside of you and you begin to uh, live faithful for Christians. And some will even use that if someone claims to be a Christian and sins, they'll say, well, he wasn't a Christian in the first place because the Holy Spirit would not allow him to sin. The Holy Spirit does not interfere with man's free will. There is no direct indwelling on the Christian of any kind. Uh, the gifts given via or by the Holy Spirit through the laying on of the apostles' hands uh, that ceased to exist after the apostles had, had died. 
uh, and they were no longer to impart gifts. Again, I'd send you back to Acts chapter 8 where you see that the gifts were given by the laying on of hands. Matter of fact, listen to 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. Charity never faileth, that's love, love never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail or cease. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away or cease. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Many people get confused there. So our, our Bible didn't come to us in one sitting. It was given in part, uh, just as people had miraculous gifts in part. He says, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Prophecy and even the miraculous gifts. Now, I have had conversations with people. They say, now, wait a minute. Uh, when that which is perfect is Jesus. And so until Jesus comes back, we are going to have prophecy. We're going to have miraculous gifts. That word perfect means complete. Uh, again, I don't have this in my notes. The word there is teleos. It, it, that word never ever is referred to uh, Jesus. Matter of fact, that word is gender neutral. And so Paul is talking about something which is gender, gender neutral and He's using a word that is never, ever associated with Jesus Christ. So this perfect thing we're talking about is not Jesus. Uh, he's talking about the time when the completed Scriptures has come. That's what perfect means, to be complete. When that which is complete, okay? And so he's, he's getting us to understand that when the completed thing comes, there'll be no more need for revealed prophecy or the miraculous gifts. Now, you may be saying, well, what exactly is that? Let's go on over to James 1.25. Here you're going to see this completed thing, this perfect thing. And here the word is, again, used in a gender-neutral way. James 1.25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You see how that ties in with being justified through the faith, Romans 5, 1. Uh, again, it's teaching the same thing. The Holy Spirit works through the Word. The Christian is deemed justified or righteous through obedience to the faith. Okay, And that's clearly visible in the fruit of the Christian's life. Now, understanding this, gives us the standard not only to find peace in this life as a Christian, but also to have peace with God uh, and oftentimes to have peace with this world. Let's go on down to verse 6 here. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. What is Paul talking about when he says, for when we were yet without strength? Paul's basing this passage here on the previous verse, and he shows the continuation in thought with the word for. For when we were yet without strength. There was a time when each of us was, was sinful and weak. We were separated from God, and yet there was a way later that we learned we could have our sins removed. Uh, but prior to that understanding and that knowledge, and when, when we were in that sinful state, living in sin by choice, we were yet without strength. But he says, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ came so that there could be atonement for man's sins. Now, the Jews reject that. They still are waiting to reestablish their temple and to reestablish sacrifices and so forth. And they don't understand that the ultimate sacrifice has already been given. <clears throat> Listen to John 1.29. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next day John, we're talking about John the Baptist, seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. Well, he could do that because he was the perfect Lamb of God without sin. He was the ultimate sinless, pure sacrifice, which could be made on man's behalf, who all men at some point find themselves in this position without strength, and yet eventually they realized that there was a Christ who came and He died for the ungodly. Again, when He says without strength, He's talking about weakness, right? It, it, if I were to tell someone that I don't, I don't have strength, I'm talking about being weak. Why am I weak? Well, we're talking about spiritual weakness, spiritual sickness, uh, one who is spiritually without strength. And man's not capable of providing a, 
solution to the problem of sin in their life. They're spiritually unable to, to do that. Listen to Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That phrase, without strength, is usually applied to those who are sick, those who are feeble or without strength, showing really just how degrading and debilitating the disease of sin is really, really for mankind. And I don't think most people realize that today. You can walk around physically looking healthy and be the most sick individual, and yet nobody knows it. And what's even worse is many people don't even realize it themselves. He says, but in due time. Now, this phrase is commonly understood to be referring to the fullness of time, used in a number of passages throughout our New Testament. And it's speaking of the correct time in history when Christ came. We know that the time was actually foreordained by the Father before the world even began. We know that Christ had an appointed time when He would come and when He would die for the ungodly. That's actually what Paul says in verse 6. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. The Jews were living under a system where they didn't have a Messiah or a Redeemer, and they were offering sacrifices because of their sin. But there was going to be a time, and it had already been appointed, where God was going to send the Messiah, where God was going to come in the flesh... Christ was God in the flesh, and He would die for the ungodly. The Word came to the earth to live among men and to be our Messiah. Listen to John 1.4. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now Paul says, He came and He died for the ungodly. That means instead of. Every one of us deserves to die for our sins uh, and to spend a spiritual eternity away from God. And yet Christ came and he paid, the, he paid the sacrifice that I could never pay so that I would have the opportunity to be reconciled back to God. The death of Jesus happened for the ungodly. That's, that's everybody. Everybody has sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. The consequence is death, Romans 6.23. But Christ came and He died for those who had transgressed His word and they were worthy of the punishment of death. And so it's necessary that all people understand that. Uh, Christ didn't die to save men in their sins. He came to die them from the penalty of their sin. But it's not something that's given freely. It is a gift, but there are requirements for receiving the gift. And no person can be righteous in uh, a continual state of sin or, or righteous in a position with unrepented sin. And the idea again is, is they have to stop. They have to be justified through the faith. They have to come to terms with God uh, and His requirements for man. And when I say they have to come to an understanding of that, I mean they have to understand that He is the one in a position of authority and they're required to be faithful according to His Word. Now, Paul goes on in Romans 5, 7. He just got done mentioning about how Christ died for the ungodly. And then he says this, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. I mean, most people, if they know a really good person, they're not going to be, real, they're not going to be willing to die for him. I would say on average. Uh, if I was being... If I was being mugged on a subway at gunpoint, I don't have a whole lot of faith that somebody I don't know is going to be willing to die on my behalf. But he goes on, Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. It's possible somebody might see, see that you're a good person and they might be willing to die. Right? But Christ was willing to die for, for those who could be described as lawbreakers, sinners, horrible people, um, murderers. What's the most detestable things you can think of? Child molesters, murderers, adulterers, whatever it might be. He came, to die, he came to die for those people. And His love for His creation is seen in the very fact that when, when we were weak, when we were ungodly, when we were in a state of sin, Christ, He died instead of us. Now again, the, the gift is conditional on the basis of what the gospel teaches because he teaches to receive the benefits offered in His death. We have to be in Christ. 
and that I could go on and, and present a whole other lesson talking about getting into Christ. Write down Romans 6, 3, and 4. Uh, we get into Christ through the, the death, burial, and the resurrection as we are immersed in water. Write down Galatians 3, 26, and 27. That's a whole other lesson. Uh, this gift of, of grace and peace and, and accessing the sacrifice He made on our behalf, uh, that's only available by being in Christ. Let's talk about this reconciliation by His death. Romans 5, starting in verse 9. Much more than being now justified, there Paul's back to justification. Anytime you see the word righteous or justification, you can pretty much interchange those two words. Much more than being now justified by His blood. Right? There's nothing that I can do to justify myself. I'm justified through His blood. However, there are requirements for the Christian. And so I, I have to be in alignment with those requirements. As we've already seen, we're justified through the faith. Uh, but I can't glory in myself because I'm justified through His blood. Yet as a servant, that is my required duty. Right? I, I, we can go back and look at the Bible verses that say I can't glory in it because I'm nothing more than just a servant. It's my duty. He, he goes on, Being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Well, who's going to be saved from wrath? Those who are justified by His blood. That can't occur at all unless you've obeyed the gospel and become a Christian. And it continues to take place, being justified by the blood, as we repent and confess and again are faithful. Again, uh, write down 1 John 1, 7 through 9. His blood continues to cleanse. So God's creation has been promised to be saved from this wrath. When I say God's creation, I'm talking about those who are faithful. All creation have been offered this promise. Not, not all have accessed this promise. Um, and so, the idea of being justified can only occur through the blood of Christ. Uh, all of the New Testament descriptions of atonement, they center on Christ and the blood which He shed at the cross. We know that His blood was necessary for redemption. Write down Ephesians 1, 7. Write down Hebrews 9, 12. We know that His blood was required or necessary for justification. Uh, we're going to look here, right here at Romans 5, 9, being justified by His blood. We know it's required for reconciliation. For man to be reconciled back to God requires the blood of Christ, Colossians 1, 20. And we realize that it's necessary for the purchase of the church. The church was purchased with His blood. There'd be no church if Jesus hadn't died on a cross. Uh, and spill, had his blood spilled. It's what purchased the church, Acts 20, 28. And so it, the Scriptures are very clear in teaching that man can only be righteous because of Christ's shed blood. But we also learn that is intermingled directly with our obedience to the faith based on his sacrifice. The whole fact or the whole reason that I am a Christian and, and striving to be in alignment with his will or what's been revealed to us in the Scriptures is based on the very fact that Jesus shed His blood for all men, even when we were sinners. I understand that. I accept the sacrifice He's made on my behalf, and therefore I accept my obligation to be in alignment with His will for all men. Romans 5.10, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. All right, for if when we were enemies. If there was a point in my life, and there was before I was a Christian, that I was an enemy with God, He is describing somebody who is opposing God's will. Right? I'm not being justified through the faith. I'm not righteous through the faith. I am an enemy with God because I'm not living according to God's will. Right? God cannot sin because it's against His nature. He's an enemy of those who willingly practice it. And because sin's against His nature, He can't accept sin. The majority of people I know who are sinners and living in sin still think they're going to heaven, and yet they don't realize they're enemies with God. They're not righteous or justified through the faith, and there's no way that they could spend an eternity in a place of purity without sin because they themselves currently are sinful. And, and they really can't, I guess, comprehend that. Notice Psalms 5.5, 5, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. I wish many of the people I 
I talk to on a daily, daily basis could get this. He goes on, Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Talking about those who are involved in sin. However, even though there is a point where all men are at odds with God or enemies with God, there is a point at which we can no longer be any enemies with Him. Again, when we are justified through faith, when we are reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Well, to be reconciled means to exchange or to change mutually, right? Uh, the idea of reconciliation is, is you have two groups, they're angry with one another, they're separated on issues, whatever it may be, and the idea of reconciliation is, is that uh, they are brought together, no longer, no longer hostile and angry and hateful towards one another, but they now have a relationship with peace. That's the whole idea of reconciliation, right? If a husband and a wife were to be separated, to be reconciled means that they are to come back together. Again, it's that state of of peace or matrimony. Same thing with friends. Friends can, can be at odds with one another, but to be reconciled would be, again, to be at a state of peace. He's saying that we can have this with God by the death of His Son. Now, certainly, maybe this is confusing to some. Some say, so God, God, hates, God hates people? Well, God does hate. He hates the sins committed by the sinner. The Bible makes it very clear that God doesn't want anybody to perish. As a matter of fact, He's been long-suffering. Um, the sinner, though, certainly, whether they know it or not, they hate God through the very fact that they're disobedient. Uh, Psalms 14.1. And now, notice again here, and I, I've mentioned this before, we're reconciled to God. That's what the Scriptures teach. We're reconciled to God by the death of His Son. God is not reconciled to us. Everything has to be done on God's terms, okay? Why are we reconciled to God? Because we're the ones that have to change. How do we have to change? We have to obey the gospel. We then have to fall in line with the faith, the system of faith, so that we can be justified. So we're the ones that do the changing. He says, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Paul's teaching... If it's the case that we had the ability to be reconciled back to God while we were enemies, then it has to be the case that being justified and no longer enemies, we're certainly going to be saved. It's just logical. Now, reconciliation implies a number of things. One, that there was a previous friendship that had existed. Something happened to break this friendship, and there was a means of restoration of this friendship. So you may be saying, so are you saying that from the very minute you're born until you become a Christian, you're separated from God. No, I didn't say that, and the Bible doesn't teach that. We know that children are born innocent and pure. And really, this is a whole other study, but uh, children, children are pure. They're innocent. Uh, but there does come a point where children begin to sin uh, when they become of age, when they come to the age where they know right from wrong. And at that point... When they lose their innocence, they become the enemies of God. And yet the innocence that they, won, they once had, that they lost, they can reachieve by submitting to the will of God, by obeying the gospel, by being added to the church and being justified through the faith and being reconciled back to God. They were already at one point in a friendship or in a relationship with God due to their pure state. They lost it, but they can be reconciled back. Notice Romans 5.11. We'll keep going on. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Paul's saying, if you think all this is good, if you think this is, is wonderful, you just wait and see what else is, is coming. We also joy through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus Christ that the system, the Christian system was established. It's through His sacrifice, it's through His teaching, it's through the appointment of the apostles who continued to teach by His authority, and it is through this system of faith which was established by Jesus Christ and by our inspired writers which was recorded for us. Listen again, let's go back to Romans 5, 1 and 2. And therefore, being justified by faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What is Paul saying? Paul says the system of faith or this Christian system, it gives us access to this grace. It gives us access to this peace. It gives us access to this process of reconciliation. And he says, notice here, by whom we have now received atonement. I'll go back here to Romans 5.11. Atonement means rest restoration. It means reconciliation. Our relationship to the Father, as I've already mentioned, when we're born, we're pure, but we then become enemies of God when we begin to sin and to not live according to the will of God. But this whole, this whole situation can be uh, restored or it can be reconciled by the blood of Christ when we obey the gospel and then our obedience to the system of faith, which is the Christian system, which is how we are justified. We're justified by faith, by the system of faith. Paul shows a number of times, both the Christian and the non-Christian, uh, that they can, have, they can have inner spiritual peace and contentment, and that reconciliation is possible, that it's only possible, but that it is only possible through the blood of Christ. And along with this peace we've already mentioned comes all spiritual blessings and the absence of condemnation for the sins that we have once committed. Remember, I mentioned before, if you're watching this and you're an erring Christian, and you're in sin, those sins can be washed away again. You can repent of that. You can, again, you can again be faithful. You can again be reconciled back to God. If you're watching this and you're not a Christian, the only way that's going to happen is for you to start that walk with Christ, and that's to obey the gospel. Now, if you're watching this and you're not a Christian, it's not a complicated process. I would encourage you to go back, study your scriptures. The conversion accounts show that there was somebody teaching the gospel. That's how faith comes. Romans 10, 17. We find that people would hear the gospel and they would accept and believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And Jesus said, if, if you won't do that, you're going to die in your sins, John 8, 24. They also, because of their understanding, they had faith, Hebrews eleven six. 6. They didn't just believe in Jesus, as many would teach today. They also understood the consequence of sin. Uh, Jesus made it very clear that you have to repent of sin. And I don't know anybody, when you ask them, they'll say, well, you just have to believe. And I'll say, well, do you have to repent? I've never had anyone say, no, you don't have to repent. You do. Jesus makes it very clear, Luke 13, 3 and 5. And Paul taught the same thing over in Acts 17, 30. So during the first century, people were listening to men preach the gospel. They believed Jesus was the Messiah. They understood that there was just one church. They understood that they had sin. They needed to repent of their sin. They understood that they needed to confess Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10, same thing as we find the Ethiopian eunuch doing verbally there in Acts chapter 8. And we also learn in every conversion account, and I know people, they get so angry when you say it, but in every conversion account, the culminating act was submitting to baptism. And Jesus declares very clearly that you have to be baptized to be saved. Mark 16, 15 and 16. Now, if you don't believe Jesus' words, which I would hope that you would, you could go over and look at 1 Peter 3.21 where Peter makes it very clear and it states there by inspiration, uh, and now baptism doth also now save us. It's not the only thing that saves you, but baptism is part of what saves you. It's part of obeying the gospel. If you don't like the phrase, and I don't use it all that often, if you don't like the phrase plan of salvation, I see people that, that don't like that phrase or where some people talk about the five steps. There's, I, I don't teach that, uh, five steps. I, I guess I'm a six-stepper. Uh, don't call it the plan of salvation. Call it the biblical accounts that you find for conversion. They heard it, they believed it, they repented of their sins, they confessed Christ, and they were immersed in water. And the way that people became Christians is how they, became, how they become Christians today. Now, I mentioned five things, but I don't stop there because the Bible goes on and talks about us living faithfully, 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, Revelation 2, 10. And again, notice we are justified through the faith and we have to continue standing in Him. So it's an ongoing process. Now, if you're watching this and you've never heard that, or if you're not sure if you've obeyed the gospel, we would love to study with you. If need be, we'll find someone in your area that could study with you. If you're watching this and you're a Christian, 
and you are in error, please let me encourage you to go back, study the Bible, realize what you need to do to be faithful, repent of those sins and continue to be faithful, uh, being justified according to the system of faith. Again, if there's a way we can help you in any way, you can contact us.